Hello and welcome. Kalispera says, welcome to our panel discussion concerning creating people advantage and the future of work. Lots of questions to be answered, lots of talking points for an issue that we're all well aware of. I mean, the, the global health crisis over the last, the last two years have changed um, very many things in the way we interact, in the way we work, in the way we are um, uh, confronted in our work environment. So this is the issue we're discussing for the next 35 minutes. Stay tuned. My name is Nikki Liberaki. I'm a journalist and let me welcome Deloitte Principal Consulting Global Future of Work Leader Stephen Hatfield. Stephen is joining us online. Hello Stephen. Hi there. Thank you for being with us. Hello Nikki. Thank you everyone. So and here um, with me. Yes. Yes Stephen. No, go ahead. Okay, uh, here with me is Evi Hadjoanu, HR man General Manager for uh, National Bank of Greece. Hello, Evi, welcome. Nice and Nikos Konstaikis, uh, Managing Director Athens and Global VP, Sportbook Product for OpenBed. Did I, did I put it right? Did That's you? fine, Nikki. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. So here we are, we're discussing the future of work, uh, basically how many changes that have been more or less forced on us by the pandemic are here to stay, a new, a, a new normal, one would say. Um, Lots of talking points, as I said, but I'm sure it will be um, best to hear from you first, Stephen. Stephen has a presentation of a study for the future of work, and I believe this will be the um, ideal basis for our discussion. So, Stephen, the floor is yours. Thank you, everyone. Very excited to be here. Very excited to be talking about this. Deloitte asked me to take on the role of Global Future of Work Leader back in 2017. And in those days, we were just early days talking about this topic. And now it's so front and center. I've had the pleasure of watching the trends accelerate through the course of the pandemic. And so where are we now? What are we actually talking about? And so as you can see from this slide, there are these, you know, the CEOs um, of major organizations are now talking about this in interesting ways. The way in which um, the, the great resignation, the great uh, exhaustion, the great reshuffle. And you can see here Jane Frazier from Citibank talking about how this is unsustainable or Bill McDermott from um, ServiceNow about this is a human moment. And if it's not about human humanity, then it won't succeed going forward in the future. And so as we think about this, we need to step back and think a little bit more about, well, um, where have we come from? What has been that progression of, of, of how we have evolved in this new future of work? And so part of what we need to think through is um, that the first and second, and to some extent, even the third industrial revolutions have sort of framed how we think about the topic. Um, they have sort of formed our, our view of productivity. They formed our view of, in factory versus in office. And in large part, they've led us to think about automation in, in, in a way that quite possibly might not be the way we need to move forward. The Economist spoke a little bit in 2015 about how the automation that was taking place in the workplace today was akin to Taylorism from Frederick Taylor around throughput and output in the first and second industrial revolution and how digital Taylorism actually isn't the way that we need to progress. And so as you think about where we're headed from where we've come, there is, this, um, there is this step change. Are we actually in the fourth industrial revolution or is it something else? I've spoken um, with some uh, other thinkers uh, recently, Thomas Friedman, who's a well-known author and um, a, co a, a, a um, columnist for the New York Times. And he referred to what we're experiencing now as a Promethean moment a step change, something new and different of an extreme, uh, extreme degree. And so where does that leave us, right? What are the different trends that we're now seeing and experiencing in terms of where we're headed? And so part of those trends involve um, that we're, we're, we're seeing uh, new needs around the human potential and the focus on humanization and driving that in a way that's different than before. We're seeing changes in the physical and digital workplace in new and different ways. The work tech market is exploding as we're all spending time on these digital platforms. 
We're seeing organizations shift their business models because of the extent to which they have had to create new opportunities to engage customers, new, new ways to serve their markets virtually and in a hybrid fashion. And so that's now proliferating. We're seeing changes in leadership and connection that are new and different. Um, and it's much, much more now about authenticity, much, much more now about empowerment. And we're seeing a shift. Skills and trust are becoming the new currency of an organization. And so now what's tra transpiring is the extent to which organizations are looking at how to engender trust and how to think about how do we upskill and reskill? How do we tap in to that potential of our workforce in a new and a different way? And so in order for us to um, address these trends, it's important for us to think about it in terms of the work, the workforce, and the workplace. And by work, we're talking about the value of the work, the tasks, the, 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 the activities. It's much more about outcomes as opposed to outputs. And how do we focus on the new outcomes that we want to create as we have machines and humans collaborating together? And we're watching that collaboration happen across all industries. We're seeing more of it happen in production lines as we are seeing it within the knowledge sector. And then workforce. How do we think about the workforce in terms of the new skills? How do we think about the capabilities that they bring to the table which endure and never change? How do we address new talent models and actually looking for talent in different ways? Applying sort of an ecosystem view to access the skills you need when you need them. And now that we're all on these digital platforms, you can tap into talent in different ways globally than ever before. And then finally, the workplace. And this is much more about the combination of the physical and the digital. How do we shed that mental model around us being on a production line in a factory from the second industrial revolution to us all being in an office, but yet still in a sea of cubicles from the third industrial revolution? How do we create something that is a different mix of that new physical and digital workplace where the digital workplace is actually geared to the um, the needs of the workforce of today. And so with that, we're talking in fact about humanizing work and elevating what humans do and shifting from outputs to outcomes, shifting from process to flow, shifting from thinking about it in terms of technology versus thinking about it in terms of a broad capability. Are we talking about file sharing? Or are we talking about collective intelligence and knowledge management? And thinking about it in terms of not just um, sort of a, a, a myopic, but rather much more of a symphonic. This is actually about multiple disciplines within an organization, real estate and IT and HR coming together to solve this complex problem. But the opportunity for us is great because if we are able to think about humanizing and elevating in, a, in the way that we're talking about now, we can create something much better. And I think it's a world of possibility in our ability to, in effect, humanize work and move to a place where productivity is something new and different. It's not about um, the efficacy and efficiency, but it's much more about human performance and how do we elevate how humans operate and work. And in doing so, not just increase productivity, but create more opportunities for innovation, more opportunities for well-being more opportunities for purpose and meaning at work. And so I hope that we don't miss this opportunity because unfortunately often when you think about work, you miss the opportunity as, as um, uh, Thomas Edison has said, um, opportunity comes in the form of work, but we miss it because it's, it's where we're wearing overalls. And, and so in, with that, I hope that we can like, gain the ground on this opportunity, and let's get to work. Thank you, everyone.
Thank you, Stephen. Thank you for this uh, presentation. Just allow me to say, uh, as I was listening to when, what Stephen uh, was saying, that I believe humanizing work, at least for, for the Greek standards, would require a, a very radical change for most organizations in the country. So hopefully we'll have the time and I'll get back to you with uh, some questions. But now um, let's, let's focus in, in Greece with you, Evi, beginning from the National Bank of Greece and setting the question. Um, we're always discussing the future, the future of work in particular. It seems that the future is now. We have no time to, to adapt, as we would hope for. And this is a major challenge. And I would like you to, to tell us a bit about the, the main, the, the biggest and the most severe challenges that any organization has in this journey to, to adapt, to evolve, to become, to stay relevant. And of course, the top priorities. Thank you, Nikki, for the question. And uh, thank you, Stephen, because uh, all we heard, I think it was very inspiring. Now, I cannot say that I don't agree that uh, this new normal is here to say, and I think that uh, what we need to work on is how we will embrace this new normal in order to have the relevant benefit and value for every organization. Mm -hmm. Now, there are challenges, but also I believe that there are hidden opportunities there, and every challenge can be an opportunity. And I would kind of differentiate the challenges into some short-term challenges that uh, we needed to, 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 to address and we're still addressing because also the COVID crisis is not yet done. And uh, some mid to longer terms. And um, I have three main things in my mind to say it. First of all, the remote working. I think that uh, we all know that four to five times we have more remote working than we used to have. In NPG, we had no remote working before the COVID crisis. So what we needed to do is very promptly and very swiftly adjust our working model in a way that uh, we make our people feel safe, but also uh, sustain our operational uh, performance. And we reached uh, even more than 50% of remote working in our peak. Now, there is an opportunity out of it because we are already started working uh, in uh, shifting a bit the workplaces to have flexible workplaces so that we reduce uh, uh, our uh, workspace and overall cost at the end. However, I think there is a hidden challenge there because the scale of these transitions influence, in my opinion, labor trends. And so policy makers and collective bargaining that still in Greece are very relevant, especially in the banking sector that I work with, should make steps to support the required flexibility that all these new ways of working require in order to succeed. For example, what do we mean by working time? What do we mean exactly by overtime? What do we mean by working place? And things like that. A second challenge I consider to be the role of the employers that should play in terms of uh, what we define as physical or mental health of our employees. And I think that's something Stephen also addressed. Yeah. And he agrees right now as well, <laughs> as we can see. We should, uh, uh, how can I say, worry a bit more and work a lot more uh, in a different aspects of our employees' well-being. What we did very promptly, I think, and the feedback we got was very relevant, is that we launched employee assistance programs during all this crisis, and we believe that it will remain. It was not a uh, once-off uh, uh, for the crisis uh, moment. Last but not least, I think that uh, this crisis also uh, created some inequities. For example, we are a retail bank. That means that we have branches all over Greece and the people, our colleagues in the branches cannot work remotely. So what we had to, to confront is some people that could work remotely and we had all the relevant means to work remotely for them to feel safe mm -hmm. and to have the flexibility required, but some people that needed to be on site. And we needed to work to minimize the inequity uh, uh, behind that. So first of all, we provided very quickly all the means and we took all the precautions for them to feel safe. But apart from that, and we did it, I, I believe, quite successfully, but apart from that, we needed to have to show 
but also to actually uh, live the, the empathy required that uh, we know what they are confronting every day. We know the daily fear of being offloaded with COVID and we are there with them. So we visited the branches. We were there with them so that uh, uh, we somehow... Uh, a sense of caring. A sense of caring and sense that we are with you, even if we are not daily with you at the branch. Now, mid to long term, we have all these uh, things that uh, Stephen very correctly pointed out that we have started working and we need to continue working. I believe that there is actually an opportunity to think a bit out of the box in what we define, how do we find works, how we define capabilities, outcomes, reskilling, everything around people, the architecture of work in general. And in my opinion, the framework around work at the end will define the competitiveness of the economy of each country. Okay, um, so thank you, thank you, Evie, for that. Uh, I would like to focus with you, Nikos, mostly on the digital character of the workplace currently. So we, we spoke about digital and digital, and indeed, uh, this is something that was not happening, at least not in this scale, prior to the, the pandemic. So the question for you is, which are the steps that organi organizations need to take to ensure that their employees will manage to thrive in such an environment. And what do you do, for example? Absolutely. Thank you, Nikki, first of all, for the question. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I think, first of all, it's uh, an evolving uh, situation that uh, we are after here. I believe, you know, the biggest uh, kind of uh, thing underpinning the whole situation is uncertainty, right? And don't believe that uh, we, uh, irrespective of where we sit and what we do, we all kind of have uh, more knowledge than anyone else on how this uh, will end. Uh, but I think uh, the key principles uh, that uh, we, we have started to build around the fact that uh, this is here to stay, it's something that is not a temporary setback. And uh, I do share the view uh, that, uh, you know, both co-panelists shared actually that this is an opportunity, right? Uh, every change is a challenge. But I think, uh, you know, by embracing a change, uh, you kind of uh, develop from there and you can kind of uh, harness the benefits of an opportunity. And I think this is exactly kind of uh, the milestone that uh, we are uh, sitting today. Uh, so first of all, acknowledge it uh, and make sure that it's here to stay and embrace it. That's, uh, you know, kind of number one. Number two, I felt that, uh, you know, we were almost ready for that and uh, it was uh, as if the pandemic kind of forced us to something that uh, we were already ready to adapt to. And, you know, it kind of surprised me as well the fact that, uh, you know, within 24 hours, for example, our company switched into fully remote uh, without kind of uh, any kind of uh, impact from a business continuity perspective, which, you know, it means that it was ready uh, to happen. Uh, however, I think that uh, we need to create a sustainable environment for that, right? I mean, just uh, executing uh, against something that uh, was reactive uh, is not, uh, doesn't mean that in the end of the day this is a sustainable uh, piece. And uh, I think it's important that we build out the mechanisms even, you know, the small, get the basic things uh, right, like, uh, you know, uh, the internet, the network uh, pieces. Uh, I believe the most common question uh, that comes out uh, in every single conversation is, can you see me? Can you still hear me? <laughs> I think it's, uh, you Indeed. know, kind of uh, the new trend in uh, the last couple of years. So get the basics right. Uh, so I believe we need to create a sustainable, uh, flexible environment for all our people. Mm -hmm. uh, I think my number three is uh, we need to build out the culture as kind of uh, big organizations, global organizations, we need to build out the culture that uh, is ready to adapt and uh, set out the new world uh, principles, which uh, will definitely be around uh, you know, trust, uh, communication, transparency, and in the end, you need to maintain the feeling that you belong, right? Because one of the main kind of, uh, I think, uh, important aspects of being physical is you're part of uh, a community, yeah. right? And you yeah. still belong. And it's harder to get this 100% uh, right when everything becomes flexible. It's a combination of uh, you know, digital and physical. Uh, I think uh, in, uh, at the same time, uh, we need to adopt our kind of uh, organizational toolkit in order to uh, serve that, uh, build out uh, kind of uh, the right uh, engagement tools that uh, kind of uh, treat people equally, no matter where they work. I kind of uh, relate with the example of, uh, you know, uh, a retail operator like the National Bank on Freeze. How do you maintain this equality? How do you build out new engagement toolkits uh, with your employees in order to communicate in a fair and equal way uh, with them? And uh, I guess my, my kind of uh, last bit is uh, we cannot forget and underestimate the fact that uh, every change comes with disadvantages as well. 
And uh, I do believe that uh, physical has important advantages uh, that uh, we cannot ignore, which are around uh, you know, social communication, social interaction, and uh, especially when it comes uh, down to humans and uh, uh, the employment. Uh, in particular, I believe a lot on uh, uh, the development of people, upskilling them, reskilling them, and I, by no means I believe that uh, organizations today are ready to uh, kind of transition this in a fully digital way. Mm -hmm. uh, so I do believe that uh, we need to acknowledge that uh, again, uh, make sure that uh, this is uh, top of our agenda because uh, we're, we're talking about people, about humans, and uh, we need to develop them firmer, further. These are talent, and this is the end of the day what fuels uh, you know our uh, businesses, and the end of the day it's kind of uh, economy. So that's. Okay, uh, you've mentioned reskilling, upskilling. Uh, Stephen spoke of these uh, necessities, needs to, to help people evolve and stay relevant and focus on an ever changing work environment. So uh, I would like to, to ask Stephen about the uh, upskilling and reskilling and whether um, you could, you could, um, you could focus on some skills that you think will be necessary in the years to come, in the current uh, workplace status and in the future of work? Sure. So um, it's interesting. We found in the course of the pandemic that those organizations that understood the full capabilities of their workforce were able to redeploy them much more rapidly than those that actually only understood them based on the bullets in their job description. And so that need to be able to sort of understand who we really have and what kind of skills and capabilities they really bring to the table became paramount. We did a survey with Fortune of CEOs and we asked what was the number one um, uh, ab ability they would want to have in order to manage future disruptions. And they cited the ability of their organization to adapt and upskill and take on new roles. And so we think that's gonna become paramount. And we're seeing that more and more now in unfortunately this environment of the great resignation. So the labor shortage is actually in many respects a skill shortage. And so as organizations clock in to the idea that it's about the potential of their workforce and how do they find the skills in a different way? How do they develop those capabilities in a different way? What starts to emerge is a set of enduring human capabilities, which organizations will start to focus on and will become part and parcel of what every worker brings to the table, a certain degree of tech savviness, a certain degree of complex systems thinking, a certain degree of storytelling and communication skills and data visualization, um, venture management, the ability to bring a project to life, to bring a venture together, to sort of visualize and, and execute on that. And, and then problem solving, but hypothesis-driven problem solving. They say that um, about 25% of the global knowledge workers will use digital assistance within the next two years, meaning that we will ask AI tools like Siri and Alexa to help us with information. And so the ability to understand how to, how to ask those questions and solve those problems will become part and parcel of what comes to the table. And so that collection of skills will endure as you move across different projects, as you begin to do different things, as you progress in an organization. The one other that I, would rec that I think is gonna become paramount goes back to leaders. So learning how to lead in this digital environment, learning how to lead in this world that has emerged, that authenticity and that empathy as applied to the workforce itself. You need to have the ability to understand how to break down the work of the team, recognize when we need to be together to get something done best, and when can we be apart? And when we're apart, how do we contract together to work in the way that makes the most sense for us as a team? When are we together physically? When do we work asynchronously on a collaboration tool? When do we work synchronously, separately? So How many, do we many many new 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 challenges ahead of leadership, company leadership, organization leadership, and and the workforce. So um, I'm going to catch you there, um, Stephen, because it, this is a question that I, I would also like to address to you, Evie, concerning the, the challenges 
and the expectations from leadership. Uh, everything seems to be changing. I believe that this uh, is uh, the case as well for leaders. So how can we make sure that we deliver an effective vision and purpose to our organization? Thank you for the question. And I think that we have covered many of these uh, notions, let's say, of uh, what we need from our leaders now even more than before. In my opinion, it was a necessity in general, but more now. Uh, and for me, the crisis and every crisis moves people a bit back to the basics. And back to the basics, I mean, what do we need by a leader? How we embrace a leader? So we're not talking anymore, I think, about authority or power. We're talking about seeing a leader as human, as a simple person feeling that you have a proximity with him or her. And certainly be authentic. So for me, these messages and the way you, somebody uh, uh, communicates these messages is uh, of most power. What we were trying to do actually, uh, as a also, uh, how can I say, as a way also to, to evolve our culture uh, in NBG is, um, we change the way we communicate, and we change the way we communicate in terms of frequency, in terms of content, in terms of means. We use a lot of means. Technology now that thrived through the pandemic helped us a lot. So we did uh, uh, town hall meetings, uh, we did uh, breakfast meetings with the CEO, we did direct mail, uh, showing a lot of empathy during this uh, crisis. Uh, we changed a bit the content, and uh, we changed also the wording of uh, how, uh, you know, NBG is a very traditional uh, kind of uh, uh, formal so organization. So we talked casual. We talked in a simple way. We addressed our people uh, in a more, you know, simple words so that we fully understand mm -hmm. and they fully understand the, 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 the meaning. And then we accelerated the revision uh, uh, of our purpose and values exercise, which we have started. And I, uh, we thought that even during the pandemic, it was a necessity. So we revised and we launched our values. We said that we want to become human, actually. We want to be a growth catalyst. We want to be efficient. We want to be uh, um, uh, trustworthy. And then we, we launched our purpose. And we did it for the first time in a democratic way. So another thing is that we need to democratize things in the organizations, in my opinion, so that leaders are closer Stephen to everybody. as well, as I can see. <laughs> so okay. we did it for the first time, all included in a big launch event, 7,000 people connected. And uh, we not only launched this, uh, them as, uh, you know, uh, phrases or uh, uh, just uh, notions. We tried to make everybody understand why we want to be human, why we want to be trustworthy, and how we will try to do it with examples from our customers and our daily lives. So, to use a Greek word, it's a, it's, a, it's a kind of a paradox that we needed social distancing uh, rules in order to think of how we can come closer or be more human in our uh, interaction at the workplace. Okay, so, um, Nikos, you've already mentioned that your company's, your organization's transition was um, some, somehow easier than in most cases. You were, you were ready overnight, you, you did it. So I would like you to, to point out the strongest arguments for that, that you, would, you would tell someone who, who has doubts on whether the hybrid model um, would ensure the same productivity or even better in the future. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, first of all, I think you know we were all forced into a leap of faith uh, into this uh, type Indeed. of working, uh, right? So, uh, uh, I think fortunately, uh, something that we would have been studying for years and years, and we would have been expecting the output uh, in order to take some sort of uh, probably step-by-step -step approach and decision was was forced overnight for everyone, right? As a result of it, uh, we're privileged today to have, uh, I think, uh, enough evidence, enough statistics from various organizations. Uh, about how efficient it is to actually provide, uh, you know, the flexibility to uh, work and uh, perform from wherever you are. 
uh, and I think you know it's uh, proven now that uh, productivity uh, is there. It's uh, you know not something which is descending. It's actually something that's uh, in quite a few occasions it's uh, uh, ascending. And uh, even kind of uh, one uh, day uh, of uh, flexibility to work uh, from home or from wherever uh, kind of uh, is perceived as something uh, very very positive. Uh, but um, what, what I'd, I'd like to take this, you know, kind of uh, one step ahead and uh, mm -hmm. uh, kind of uh, introduce uh, what I prefer to see as, uh, you know, the new uh, way of working, which is uh, flexible, and uh, we like to brand it, uh, at least within our organization, as dynamic. Uh, I can't, you know, I'd like to not stick into uh, either labeling this uh, hybrid, remote, or uh, physical. I, I kind of feel this a bit transactional and kind of, uh, you know, does not address uh, the human uh, nature of uh, work. So keep it dynamic. Uh, I think you know even uh, the event that we are today is flexible enough for uh, Stephen to join uh, remotely for us to be here today, and we can all kind of have a very lively conversation uh, without any kind of boundaries. Uh, so I believe this kind of uh, flexibility is uh, the kind of uh, important uh, takeaway. And then I, I really loved what uh, Stephen uh, uh, talked about uh, outcomes, not outputs, right? Which uh, for me is about uh, redefining uh, the word uh, productivity, taking it this, uh, to the next level around uh, you know, how efficient uh, you can uh, become uh, now with uh, your, uh, your outcomes and uh, in, uh, in, in the end of the day kind of uh, come up with uh, um, the important elements of the human nature around the boundaries between you know, home, work, which at the moment are not that clear, uh, right? And uh, this is something that uh, it's very important for uh, every employer, every organization to kind of uh, understand the human aspect of it, so empathy around it, mm -hmm. uh, kind of uh, c uh, create clear boundaries around it. Yes, that is correct, because the, the word flexibility itself, at least in Greece, I don't know, Stephen, if it's the same thing uh, there, but at least in Greeks, when um, employees listen to the word flexibility, uh, our mind goes directly to uh, labor rights violations, for example. So exactly. we need to have clear boundaries of our personal space and time. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and um, I guess my, my kind of uh, last point on that one is uh, that... Uh, Again, we're in an evolving situation, so listen, 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 communicate, communicate, communicate. I think, Great. you know, it's uh, inspect and adapt uh, where we are, uh, depending on, you know, every organization, uh, different uh, skill sets uh, are required, and, you know, mm -hmm. continue to listen, continue to evolve. Okay, thank you, Nikos. Uh, we, Stephen, we have uh, one minute and 30 seconds, and I promise to be on time. So, uh, a quick question. I, I noted the phrase, trust is the new currency. Uh, you mentioned it before during your presentation. I would like just a bit more from you on that one. What, what do you mean trust is the new currency in the, the, the future of work? So it's interesting, Evie brought it up, right? The, uh, we, we were in the branches with our folks because we were there with them. How does, one in, how does one engender that sense of trust so that you can then bring that workforce to that new level of performance? So for example, the digital workplace creates the opportunity for us to use all sorts of interesting data now to create a new experience for our workforce if they trust you. And if they trust you, then of course, you can ask them to do new and different things. And they'll, they'll do that based on the value that you're providing to the customer and or the connection they have to you as an employer. And so that's why it's become the new currency. Mm -hmm. That which organ leaders are now pushing to to create that trust more than they ever have before. Okay, thank you very much, Stephen. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for joining us live, as well as uh, you, Evi Hadjoanu, from the National Bank of Greece, and Nikos Konstakis from OpenBet. Thank you. And stay tuned, of course. Thank you very much for joining us.